Hi everyone, you can hear me okay? All right, welcome. So this is the Wilderness Medicine, learning the fundamentals and implementing innovative and practical educational curriculums into medical school, residency, and fellowship. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, we'll do some quick introductions on the panel. Uh, the way this is organized is we're gonna do didactics for the first half. Um, and then we're kind of breaking out into sessions based on your area of interest, what level of education you're looking to implement a curriculum, and, uh, and, and we'll break out for the last half into small groups. So I'm Lara Phillips. I'm coming from Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, and I'm the director of wilderness medicine there. Uh, Stuart Harris coming from Mass General. I'm the chief of the division of wilderness medicine and run the fellowship there. Um, Hilary Irons, I'm at... Uh, University of Massachusetts. Renee Salas, a graduate of the MGH Wilderness Medicine <coughs> Fellowship and on faculty there. Uh, Sanjay Gupta, uh, Long Island Jewish Medical Center in Northwell Health on Long Island. Peterson McGinnis, Wake Forest University in win wonderful Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Fel a new fellowship director. Liz Edelstein, I just came from Jefferson in Philadelphia, now at University of Colorado, and I co-direct a student elective with Lara in Breckenridge and uh, with some other folks in Roanoke, Virginia. So we do not have any financial disclosures. And before we get started talking into um, the curriculums, a question we often get asked is what is wilderness medicine? So just a couple, uh, a couple minutes spent on that. And I like Stewart's uh, definition, which is really the practice of medicine in resource limited and austere conditions. So to give you an example of how we still uh, implement this into our practice, if you look to the picture all the way to the right with the helicopter, that's actually Dr. Salas in 2015 evacuating patients during the earthquake in Nepal. And there was an avalanche at uh, base camp and um, she was stationed in Fairche, uh, a high altitude clinic a little below base camp, and they worked on getting patients out. The middle picture is uh, Stuart Harris, who's actually ultrasounding a climber's eye and, uh, as they're getting ready to do the nearly 20,000 um, foot dis uh, uh, summit on Mount Kilimanjaro and looking at different things like optic nerve sheath diameter and its correlation to acute mountain sickness and haste. And then the picture, uh, closest to me is Hillary Irons, and she's actually uh, in Siberia as an ex ex exhibition doctor uh, for a research team. She's wearing a bug suit. <laughs> <laughs> what you did in your is no, no knowledge to me, ma'am. And so the, the content in wilderness medicine is extremely broad. It covers everything from environmental health and risk to altitude medicine to dive, flora and fauna, infectious disease global health and humanitarian emergencies, envenomations from snakes, spiders, arthropods, uh, also addresses prolonged field care. So people in tactical combat situations uh, also may have to spend hours with a patient for getting them to a safe place. Similarly, in wilderness medicine, you may not be able to evac a patient for hours or even days in certain situations. Medical clearance for wilderness and endurance event, and given the activities people partake in the outdoors, you may encounter a fair amount of wilderness trauma and stabilizing those patients and being comfortable caring for a sick patient for hours on end before you're able to get them evacuated. <coughs> Medical services, such as search and rescue, EMS, and expedition planning. And then some backcountry skills, too. How to live friendly with the environment and things like food and water procurement. So we're going to talk about wilderness medicine education throughout a career today starting with undergraduate medical education, then we'll go on to graduate medical education, such as in residency, uh, fellowship, and then professional development, and within that, faculty development. So how is, when, once you finish your training and you're a faculty member, how do you maintain your, your skills? So I'm lucky in that I get to speak to you guys on undergraduate <laughs> medical education. This is actually, this is my son. And I show this because this actually, reminds me of the undergraduate medical learner. And it's not to say they're naive, but for many, this is their first exposure to wilderness medicine. And they go in with this fantastic sense of enthusiasm and open-mindedness, which is just a lot of fun to teach. And we'll break this down to discuss implementing the curriculum, different teaching modalities, evaluation and challenges for each of these phases of learning. So implementing curriculum. As Liz mentioned, we recently finished the um, 
Wilderness Medicine, Wilderness Environmental Medicine elective in Breckenridge, Colorado for the last month of April. And two years ago, uh, me and one of the other, um, one of the residents at the time at Jefferson, Josh Rudner, wanted to do a Wilderness Medicine elective. And so we had to think of what kind of leadership we wanted. And we know Liz has run these courses for the last 10 years. So we brought her in as someone who has done this before, someone who can give us advice. The next thing we had to decide is, well, who's our audience? For us, we wanted to do a month-long elective, and given the constraints with timing in medical school, we, we, wanted, we, we decided to teach fourth year. <coughs> and then your mission and objectives. Do you want this a really broad course, introduction to all the different fields in wilderness medicine, or do you want this something narrow, focus on high altitude or search and rescue? And then the length of time. Next, we had to receive approval from the curriculum committee. And this is where you want to voice the educational value you can provide with students. So often, these electives are a return to the physical exam in medical school without, the, without all the tests and labs and imaging. And so telling them that we're really circling back to bring it back to the basics, go back to that patient assessment. There is a cost to the students in making sure that it's, it's feasible for them. And then liability, because we had a 10-day uh, a 10 day backpacking trip at the end in Utah and how we made that safe for the students. We were able to secure infrastructure. This is a little hard to see, but it's a lodge <laughs> at the Breckenridge Outdoor Education Center, uh, which provided our lodging for the first two weeks when we did mainly didactics. And then they also supplied guides for us so that when we did go onto the backcountry portion, we could assure that the students were, safely, were safe. Next is to mobilize instructor resources. So we recruited something like 20 speakers in the first couple weeks, and they were from Jefferson, but they were also from neighboring institution. Some of them were residents, some of them were fellows, and it gave the opportunity for people to get in, involved and teach. And then we also harnessed, uh, if, if you, whatever place you go in, see if you can harness the local EMS. So for example, one morning we actually went out with a ski patrol and set off avalanche bombs, and that was one of the, the didn't talk about avalanches, and that was one of the students' favorite mornings. And then recruit the students. If your institution has a local wilderness medicine interest group, that's probably the way to go. And if they don't have one, think about starting it, because there's for sure to be a lot of interest among this group. This is essentially what our schedule looked like for the two weeks. And we decided to do a very broad overview within wilderness medicine and cover the didactics mainly in the first couple of weeks. The didactics themselves were about 48 hours of learning primarily over the, first, um, over the first two weeks. And in that, we started to integrate some workshops while we were still in Breckenridge. So if you want to get someone out, can you make a rope litter? What supplies do you have? Learning on improvisation. And then finally, we culminated all their uh, skills with simulation. So when we went into Utah, in the backcountry portion, we did um, pretty intense scenarios lasting for three to four hours. So this one was actually a mass casualty in a river and they're extracting one of the victims and then they had to splint and paddle them out and get them to the evacuation point. And they, and they basically use all the skills they learned for the first two weeks. And we rotate students who play the victims and then the rescuers. The evaluation is pass-fail. At the end of the two weeks, we did a summative um, multiple choice questions. And then in the experiential learning, the backpack country portion, it's a little harder to do curriculum. You don't have access to PowerPoint. You have to think of some alternative ways of learning, and that's where a lot of the scenario learning came into play. With, we gave them direct observation and then one-to-one -one debriefing, both with the student personally and then in the group as well. There are some challenges to this particular po population. They're very concentrated blocks of elective time and it's not necessarily available for most schools until their final year of learning. If you want to get other years involved, um, other, than their, other than fourth years, you could do other more concentrated weekends, like a wilderness weekend, or student conferences, where you could bring um, several speakers to, to one institution uh, and get different years involved. And then also, there's a cyclical nature of interest, so it may be that if a dedicated faculty member is available, you may not have the same type of, of interest. So we're going to move on to GME now with Henderson. All right. So real quick, I, I'll, I'll try to not use the mic. Um, real quick, how many residents? <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, Woo. perfect. This is your wheelhouse. How many attendings? Okay, perfect. All right. So the, the, 
the residents, what you need to do is seek out someone at your institution who's willing to help you. If not, one of the attendings in this room or one of us up here will help you. Okay? That's kind of the little plug. <laughs> so GME, what is it? So you're in residency. That's all the graduate medical <laughs> education, but it's fun. Wilderness medicine is the fun part of it, right? We all work long shifts. We all do lots of things. But wilderness medicine is a good way to get people excited and get people excited about emergency medicine because it is emergency medicine. You know, how many of you work in a big major med medical center? Okay, how many of you have rotations that take you away from there? Okay, so of those of you who are in a big major medical center, have you ever maybe had like more patients than you had beds? Yeah, or you can't find, you know, maybe you don't have a bougie, maybe you don't have this, right? So when your needs outstrip your resources, right? That's wilderness medicine, so you're doing it every day. Except when you call it wilderness medicine, it sounds cool, right? It sounds sexy, it's like, oh, wilderness medicine, yeah, that sounds really cool, let me do that. But you're, you're doing the same medicine. You're just doing it in, in a different environment sometimes with limited resources. But the challenge in graduate medical, medical education is you have so many requirements. You have so many things you have to do, so many milestones, so many mile markers, posts, blah, 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 you know, evals, all this stuff. This is not to make it complicated. This is not to give you more things to do. This is to give you something you're excited to do. This is to give you something that makes you excited about practicing emergency medicine and making it kind of fun. Walt has kind of, Walt and some other folks put together a curriculum for a longitudinal experience in wilderness medicine, like kind of the stuff you should cover during residency. It's pretty easy to, it's pretty easy to access. There's a lot of things you can cover in, in that. Thinking about what do you want to get out of wilderness medicine, right? That's really what you want to come into this from the GME standpoint of. Like, why am I, what do I need to get out of this, right? Do you have a strong background in wilderness experience already and now you're adding the medical part through your residency? Do you have no experience in wilderness and you've got strong medical? So it's like how do, you, how do you balance those things out, right? So that's why as a resident, it's super easy. You are now an educator, right? Most residents, oh, I want to teach. I like to teach. Medical students love people to teach them stuff. And what do they love? Things where they get their hands on stuff. Wilderness medicine is one of the easiest ways you can get medical students involved. And as young residents, it's a great way for you to say, do I really like to teach or do I really just want to go do this? Right? Because we all say, oh, I want to teach, I want to teach. And you can ask many of the faculty when they interview at the potential faculty applicants, I love teaching, I love teaching. <laughs> right? <laughs> what, what do you like to teach? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, sure, cricket anatomy, cricket biology, whatever you want to talk about, right? But, right, so how do you, <laughs> what, what do they like to teach? So if you had experience, it's a good way for you to develop experience. As, as Laura was saying, the student conferences, they host a student conference in Philadelphia. We have a student conference in the Southeast that all the residents and all the faculty are invited to speak at. So please see me afterwards for your, for your engraved invitation. <laughs> but no, seriously, you are an expert. You can be an expert in something. Even if you don't have, you've never been to Everest. I've oh, never been to Everest. Never been, you know, never been you know, scuba diving in Belize. Nope. But I've certainly taken care of a lot of wilderness medicine stuff and have been able to implement a lot of curriculum in our in our residency and mostly dealing with medical students. But we've been able to do like days for our residents where we break out and say, hey, today we're gonna do Wilderness Skills Day. And so we'll meet at a park. They just recently had Wellness Day and we met at a climbing gym and then talked about some climbing injuries afterwards. So it's pretty easy to do those things. You know, incorporate those into part of your, like it's great for wellness because you can incorporate it into like the resiliency part. Go out, you're gonna do a hike, you're gonna do a bike, you're gonna do, you know, picnic in the park, right? Play ultimate frisbee, whatever you want to do. You can talk about some environmental illnesses. You can talk about, you know, different things that are wilderness. But it's all emergency medicine, right? It's not to make you do extra work. It's to make you enjoy the work you're doing. That's really the big goal for GME, right? Get more education. That's what it should say, right? <laughs> but because that's your, uh, uh, all right, somebody got it. <laughs> it's totally fine. But really, this is, this, is, this is all, you're all excited about wilderness medicine, right? You want to know how to do it. You want to know how to make this part of your job and how to make this part of your career. Well, that's what we're all doing. We're all doing the things we like to do and getting out there and, and really trying to do it. And the biggest thing and the thing that gives a lot of us a lot of joy is exposing new learners to that, whether those are residents, medical students, co-attendings, or even community people, right? As, as residents, you're going to have, you have to do a scholarly project. Hey, develop a teaching module for the medical students. Develop a teaching model for, module for community you know, folks. There's a lot of great things that you can do, and I think anybody in this room is willing to help anyone else out, and that's one of the benefits of this group, 
you've got folks who are really interested in, in emergency medicine, academic emergency medicine, wilderness medicine, and everyone here will be happy to help you. Thank you. And up next is our good friend Stuart, who's going to talk about fellowship. So, thank you, Henderson. Uh, Stuart Harris, I'm, this is completely low key. If you have any questions at any point, I'm happy to stop and we can try to address them. But I'll be talking about fellowship training, kind of the next step after get more education. Um, so, the goal of fellowships is that I just come from the Fellowship Review Committee of SAEM. Um, and it's an interesting global idea of, you know, what is exactly the goal of a fellowship? Is it personal value, time to explore your personal and professional interests so you can do what you want to do? Is it more helping patient populations? Is it about getting a job? And I think we all ultimately agreed that it's any of uh, all of the above. But as I see it, the goal of Wilderness Medicine Fellowships is to train people that additional level. So you can go and become a pretty good climber or a pretty good boater or whatever else you want to do in addition to being a board certified emergency physician as we all are going to be in this room and you can have some degree of confidence in wilderness medicine. What I think differentiates a fellowship trained person is partially it's just the time. You put in the time and with that time comes the luxury of expertise. So you get to carve out a niche that this is what you do and you will be recognized for having done so. Um, part of it is to create leaders for the future. Again, you've committed in a way saying, I'm putting my time, my career uh, on the line and this is what I, I care about and this is what I'm really good at. And that's one way I think to move forward as far as job prospects. And then as far as opportunities to both explore your own educational styles and other ways to move ahead, it's something we can do. Just give an idea of the landscape, and interestingly, so this is in 2005, there are two wilderness medicine fellowships in the country. This, uh, as of last year, 16, uh, at, uh, at the end of 2017, and we need to update that slide even further. So it's a, a burgeoning field where there are a bunch of new programs, uh, talking with one of our recent grads who started a program in California. Um, the great thing is, is that respecting kind of the local geography and talents of the institution is something I think wilderness medicine fellowships do better than many other forms of postgraduate education. So some of us are very kind of mountain, we've got a good idea of what happens at altitude, and some are very saltwater oriented and they're diet medicine, some are desert, some are, so there's a nice range of different options and very different talents um, with which you can uh, explore your own personal interests. I think all of us ultimately have the three-legged stool, the teaching, research, and clinical care. We've recently added advocacy just because that's a huge portion of what we do. I think as responsible adults and physicians uh, and emergency physicians. But ideally, anywhere we're active, and I think this is true across the board of other fellowships, if we're doing clinical care, we ought to be doing research, and if you can be teaching at the same time, you know, that is great. You don't want to be doing just one. That's kind of unimaginative, and we don't like that so much. Um, for the fellowship curriculum, we, at this point, five plus years ago, all the fellowship directors got together. There is a published uh, national curriculum that's fairly broad and addresses what we think is the core and that's not prescriptive, it doesn't keep anybody from doing anything, and it's limited enough that then people's individual expertise in altitude or diet medicine or whatever else can come to the fore. So I think it's a pretty good model we've developed there. We would love to have people to get some research experience. Obviously, if you're in SAEM, you have some likelihood of maybe ending up as a, a teaching emergency physician at some point, which is a glorious career, kind of a joke that I get paid to do what I do. It's like, don't tell Dave Brown, my boss, but you know, I do it for free. Uh, just because I, I get to do what I want to do on a daily, monthly, yearly basis, um, and I get to call it work. So uh, it helps with my wife as well. Um, so research is a part of that. Is uh, And I, I look at it as, you know, if you're out in the mountains and it's like, wow, that's a cool peak over there, I'd love to go over and check that out. And it's similarly with the educational mission and what we do taking care of patients. It's like, well, I'm not sure what's going on here. Let's go exploring. Let's figure it out. And I think so much of us have research crammed into our uh, 
hearts <laughs> at, at an early age in a way that is so malignant and so unimaginative and so not fun that if you can look at it as, you know, this is cool, this is something I want to explore, um, to have that opportunity to spend a year or two doing is just a bonus in my mind. And lastly, technical skills development, that's something that if you're going to be a wilderness physician, we've seen this in Haiti and a bunch of other uh, international responses, that people may be extraordinarily good doctors, but they don't know how to camp, and they certainly don't know any technical skills. So if you're going to be taking care of somebody at altitude, having some high angle training is a good thing. If you're going to be a whitewater boater and helping people, swift water training is a critical thing. So it's just that awareness that, yes, you need to be a good doctor and maybe a, a reasonable researcher, but you also need to know your way around whatever uh, technical environment you are going to be in uh, is important. This is coming up towards 17 foot <coughs> on the valley today. How do we do it? We have a range of different ways, I think, it's differentiated from the uh, earlier phases. Just we're getting people who are more and more uh, further along in their training career. They're a lot more able to be independent. And so it's a lot more an experiential education. We have an active, you're working as a, essentially an attending in the emergency department. And I think that's just critical as far as building up your skill set with emergency medicine. You can't be a good wilderness medicine provider if you don't know how to take care of people in the front country. Um, it's kind of like, you know, uh, just not going to happen. Uh, and then we also try to build in opportunities, again, for individually driven uh, technical experience. So that may be at altitude, that may be underwater, that may be in the desert or wherever, uh, but try to have that built in. The didactics at the top of it are kind of covering that base core curriculum that we need to cover. As far as how we evaluate uh, each other, it's essentially, it's the same model you can be using when you're faculty. Maybe a little bit more uh, advanced and a little more uh, one-on-one -on -one and timely feedback ideally, but we've got clinical metrics and we can see how things are going. We're watching people with direct observation. And then you're getting more to the point that again, you're an adult and this is adult learning. And so how do you measure um, output? And it can be in your research productivity, it can be in other projects, national representation, international representation, uh, meetings in different projects. And so they're concrete rather than, well, you got a 4.5, what the hell does that mean? Like, hey, I got this cool paper in this cool journal, and you know, that's, that's neat. Um, so, or I'm on this board and I'm moving ahead on this important project that I care about, you know, that's good. Uh, the challenges are inevitably in academics or any other circumstance, time, money, um, and that's, uh, it, it doesn't take any money. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, all of our uh, operations are internally driven. We pay the bills by seeing patients. It's like, that's a glorious good thing. Um, and that's something that's pretty universally available. It's not like, I don't know if people say, oh, Harvard, you know, you got $36 billion. I can promise you I don't have a single freaking one of those $36 billion. Um, and it's stuff that we earn by seeing patients. And so that's the way the vast majority of emergency departments and academic programs across this country fund themselves. So that's no different. As far as external opportunities, we've been really lucky in that we've got a kind of a nice network of people who, between the Himalayan Rescue Association, <laughs> Woods Hole Research Center, friends in Alaska and Siberia and different places, we've been able to uh, find places. And like when Isabel came along and was very interested in dive medicine, I was like, yeah, I got my C card, but I know nothing about dive medicine. We were able to tie her in with Dan and other groups that, you know, these people are expert in what they do. So having that ability um, as you're contemplating fellowships to look at what they can offer you and how well connected in the world they are. So they don't have to be the experts, but they need to be able to uh, effectively reach out and make things happen. But the rewards are pretty obvious. This is Dr. Malka, who is somewhere across <coughs> this great country traveling right now, but that was uh, maybe a week ago in the Gila wilderness um, as we were coming out. Thank you. Why, thank you. <laughs> and the end of one. <laughs> so uh, I'm Sanjay Gupta. Uh, I'm going to be talking about professional development a bit. <coughs> Uh, so I have an academic PD director, so I get to hire all these folks to do stuff, but that's not part of it. You know, part of the burden is that when you have faculty, particularly in a very uh, niche field like wilderness medicine, there are kind of expectations, but then also a constant uh, kind of decision development and program development, because these are things that are expected that uh, and no offense to Stuart and the rest of the GME folks, 
GMH, that may not be covered, actually, in fellowship. Because fellowship is a lot of acquisition of knowledge. It's technical skills. Right, it's, uh, it's learning. But do you learn about negotiation? Do you learn how to read P&L? Do you guys know what P&L is? Profit and loss statement. Okay. <laughs> If you're going to develop a program, or if you're going to develop a uh, CMV model, if you are going to start bringing money in, who manages all that? How do you go to the medical school and negotiate for a time to uh, run a student program? How do you go to your chair to negotiate time, or space, or office, or this stuff for your program? So these are kind of things, just as an example, that you might be thinking about as you're going through fellowship, as you're going through, let's say, a resident track. Uh, in your residency or do these other programs. But these are all part of your ongoing kind of professional development, you know, once you're there and you're a faculty member. Just maybe for yourself so you don't get screwed. And uh, physicians are notoriously the worst negotiators around. Why insurance companies do really well as uh, groups going to negotiate because physicians will constantly under cut themselves. So that's just that mind. So as we talk about support, so now you're faculty, you're trained, you've gone through GME tracks, you can go somewhere and you're like, listen, I'm going to be your wilderness uh, person. And what does that really mean? I mean, oh, there's a lot of support, right? It's a really unique niche. It draws students in. It draws residents in. You're going to support the department. You're going to support the medical school. You know, you can get funding for what you do through some, there's some research funds out there that's industry sponsored. CME programs are big. I mean, there are some sites in this. Uh, country that have a really robust kind of adventure CME program, um, bringing in, in all honesty, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Uh, that's something that can be developed. So there's a lot of actually, uh, and trust me, you're not going to get that through toxicology. You're not going to get that. Um, no offense to toxicologists. <laughs> you know, you're not going to necessarily get that doing a resuscitation fellowship. But you could potentially do that in doing full nervous medicine. Um, and other things. Uh, so I'll give you an example. This past year, needs for underserved areas. So everyone remember what happened in Puerto Rico and what happened in Houston with the flooding again, storms. Uh, so my high work for an eleven billion dollar health system, twenty two hospitals. They want to send a disaster response team down, only looking to send people who have the skills that could uh, basically live in an under resourced area. Put it down there. I mean, I.e., can live with no electricity. No running water, we'll sleep outside in the tropical area. Um, it's very few people, right? And there is your field, you become very important. So going to places that are under resources, whether it's at the end of the service, or at sites of natural disasters, or at sites of other humanitarian response, your skills are really needed. So that brings value to you, it brings value to your department. Um, the thing is, we keep talking about what is your development, though, once you're there, and who's responsible. So thinking about this, is there really any sort of wilderness medicine, ongoing development curriculum anywhere? <coughs> right. So what does that look like? We don't know. But is it something that's important? Yeah. Um, because you, know, you don't want this situation to happen. Like when I had to go give a wilderness course to the medical students, and it was a Northeast conference, and we were doing all this stuff. So I show up in my cargo pants and what have you. Actually, I meant to cargo. I don't know what cargo So I'm Because <laughs> uh, I was never in the military. All right. Uh, but I had faculty from my department come in wearing suits and dresses. I like that. And then they're going, so we, what do we do? So we took a crash course in wilderness medicine for 20 minutes before this course. They were able to pull it off. But so that's not real professional development, right? So we need to have some process to, to get people up to speed doing this. Um, so if you think about this, you're going into academics. Most people who do wilderness medicine training, you're not going to go to a community hospital and use these skills. Uh, you're going to go, uh, but you want to be a better academic doctor, right? And what does that look like in wilderness medicine? What is the teaching? If you really think about it, when you're out in the field doing these four-hour scenarios that we're described, this is all in situ simulations training, right? So you need the training in, in scenario creation, checklist development and giving neutral data, right? How do you do that? How do you bring technology to that if you can? Do you somehow bring iPads and look them up because you can charge them, you know, in a, in a solar capacity now? Like, how do you do that? So that's what your academic development is. And you have courses at your medical school that provide this. So you might be able to take a traditional kind of academic development course 
and parlay that into what goes next, right? So just things like that to think about. Um, and they're kind of more targeted mentoring, but uh, I don't belie the idea that still, same sort of usual things are important. If you're going to go, you're going to develop a product, deliver a product as a academic <coughs> wilderness medicine doctor. What is that going to look like to your chair? What is that going to look like to your dean of your medical school? What is that going to look like to your residency director or the fellowship director there, right? So you're going to have to have some deliverables. So you have to go in with the mindset of, yeah, I'd love to teach. We talked about love to teach. You have something really cool to teach that is so unique, but still has to deliver something. Is that in a med student course? Is that in development? Uh, like we all put together curriculum in a residency track? Is that in being faculty in the fellowship? But specifically, what does that mean? What are you going to deliver from that? Both chapters, research papers, are you going to develop c and &E programs? And you go, listen, I need this seed money to develop this, but I'm going to return this. These are all things that you have to think about, but this also develops yourself. It forces yourself to feel uncomfortable, but it also forces yourself to move your own career forward. And obviously, you need feedback. You're going to have evaluations from your, your superiors in this. But with all this, is uh, what's really important to think about promotions, like when you go to the medical school. So I told a story the other day at the big conference that I was recently got, you know, recently last year, promoted to associate professor. Now, on the basis of doing administration, it wasn't operations, it wasn't any of this. It was based on wilderness medicine. I had the head of the uh, promotions committee for the Zucker School of Medicine, Hofstra, call me the next day. He goes, yeah, we got your file. You know, you're through, congratulations. We saw this wilderness medicine stuff. Yeah, hey, we didn't know what it was, but you look like an expert, so we have to go. Right? And this is verbatim. But I also was able to have a portfolio that, you know, if they really want to know, like, well, what is this? Can you show me? I go, yeah, I can show you. Look at this, look at this. These are your evaluations from this conference. This is me, a picture of me teaching at SAM. This is a picture of me out in the field here when I used to do uh, teaching with the Cornell Student Elective. So you also have to keep a tab of what you're doing. It's for you to also look back and reflect, but it's legitimate. This is for your school to, uh, as a kind of pilot of school. All right? So um, just that sort of thing. Challenges of, I think I just revealed the challenge. What is medicine? What is that? We're getting to the point of people knowing what this is when we're talking about 16, 17 fellowships being up and going as part of emergency medicine. And this really is an emergency medicine subspecialty. You'll have some organizations and some fields go, it's not, this is multidisciplinary. It is, but if you look at the, the number of people who are GME trained in this, in a legitimate fashion, these are emergency positions, especially over the past five to 10 years. So you have to think about it that way. So it's time for, you know, we're going to go from the toddler and then we're going to be adults. But then also, you know, kind of funding funding for all these sort of activities you do. Um, you want to do this stuff, and just remember, how do you get money to go away for a month in your department? Because again, like as Stuart mentioned, your primary responsibility is to be clinical care in an ER. You're going to be hard pressed to be able to support yourself uh, doing wilderness medicine. So just uh, think about funding. It can come. You might have to be creative. Uh, this is why you should. Think about taking classes on negotiations at last final time. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so, thank you. We'll take a moment to take some questions, and then after that, we're going to break out into um, different areas of um, training. If you, and we'll do some breakout sessions. So, any questions? It's not really a question, but more of a maybe a direction to go in. Kind of overall, have you guys heard of Medwar? Anybody? <laughs> 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 um, I'm a resident, and I did it as a medical student, so it's, I don't know, like, you're spending a weekend outside uh, and have a bunch of, like, physical and theoretical challenges to do. And in terms of, like, medical education and working with undergraduate medical students, instead of having, like, these big electives, if you could do like through the medical school like a weekly interest group get together that culminates in going to one of the med war events wherever and then like at the moment I think it's mostly enthusiasts that are like EMS and like kind of the hodgepodge group of people but 
but if you could actually get a bunch of medical schools to compete against each other and have teams, like, I think that would actually be like a pretty, even academic way to kind of have a culmination to show off a product. So students have, you know, interest in doing the, the training because, you know, you're actually going to get to practice it and see what you can show up with, you know, some random weekend. And then there's also just a product, so. What, so, what school are you at? Um, I'm currently at Maryland. Okay. So, so I'm um, the expansion race coordinator, and I've been involved in MedWar for uh, like 17 years or something like that. So I'm um, since this like second year in existence. So one thing that you can do is you can start one at your school. So that's another another way to do it. The other way to do it is you can build like I have a you know one week student course, and at sort of at the end of the student course, I built a mini med. It wasn't the 17 mile all day thing. <laughs> but it was, you know, questions hidden out in the woods and they had to navigate to them and answer the questions properly and get back in like a two hour time frame. So you can do many things. So you know, kind of build that into the testing scenario for the students in like a short term student course. Uh, and there could, you know, the same could be true for a resident weekend. So you can build like a mini network, uh, which is, less time consuming than the all day affairs, which are really cool to take part in, but we have a lot more moving parts. <laughs> so, so what I would recommend is pairing up with your <clears throat> EM interest group and your wilderness medicine interest group for the medical schools and say, hey, let's do some lunch lectures and you know, you can break them down to one a month or one every couple of weeks and you can get residents to help with that, you can get faculty to help with that, you can get local, you know, local providers to help with that. And do some of the basic things that that you're going to have to deal with, with patient, you know, patient, patient approach, those sort of things, you know, splinting, you know, patient movement. So all those things you can just look at and say, oh, it's easy. We know how to do this. So let's let's do it with some some fun things that we don't normally use, right? Pull out a bunch of stuff and just kind of play with it. You do that, the med students will get super excited about that. I know a couple former med students here certainly would would attest to that and have gotten involved with that, right? So it's a great way to get them excited. And it helps your academic career for sure. I mean, students, students in the room, would you would you go to something like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Residents, wouldn't you help out with something like that? Absolutely. Faculty. <laughs> I'm the guy who puts everybody on the spot, just so you know. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Great. So at this point, we'll kind of break up into little sections. Why don't we do, on this side of the room here, we'll do people who are interested in teaching with undergraduate medical education, medical schools, essentially. Um, front half here, we can mind GME or fellowship. Oh, okay? uh, sure. Yeah. We'll do G, um, GME and, and fellowship. And then in the back, um, faculty and professional development. So go to your area of interest, and we're going to come around and join you. <laughs>